This conference will now be recorded. Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. This is Fareha Munir, the project officer at Pakistan Biological Safety Association. And I welcome you all to the webinar series on bio-risk assessment, cornerstone of bio-risk management by PEPSA in collaboration with Fogarty International Center, NIH USA, and ZBIOS Biosafety Consulting, Belgium. This webinar series is based on the new WHO approach on the bio-risk assessment. Please note that this webinar series is a preparation for interactive practical workshops to be organized by PEPSA in the future. Attending this webinar series is a prerequisite for participating in at least the first practical workshops that will be conducted by PEPSA. So today we have with us Philippe Schrute. Philippe is a biosafety consultant at ZBIOS Biosafety Consulting Belgium. And with him, we have the co-facilitator, Dr. Hafza Mohammed, who will be translating the session in Urdu and summarizing for you. Hafza is an assistant professor at Heber Medical University, Peshawar, and also a KP chapter head of PEPSA. So before we formally start the webinar, some ground rules. It is requested to keep your cameras off, your microphones on mute. Please log in with your full name. And if you have any questions, please, please feel free to write them in the chat box. With that, I will hand over the session to Dr. Philly. Welcome. Thank you very much, Farida. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, uh, good evening. So it's my pleasure to present you this uh, seminar on biological risk assessment. And uh, given a, a number of seminars, I think that this one is very important. First, because biological risk assessment is really the cornerstone for proper virus management. We cannot control the risk properly if we don't have a good knowledge, a good, a good assessment of risk, the risk before. It's also very important because, as you know, there is a new, new WHO manual and that new bio, uh, biosafety manual is uh, by WHO is really focusing on bio-risk uh, assessment. So it's, uh, the, the approach will be mo much more risk-based than based on standards, for instance. I don't know what happens here. Uh, Philippe, try to click on your screen or your okay. slide. What I do, but okay. Oops. Okay. So the objective of this webinar series will be uh, first to pre present the new approach developed by WHO. And you will see that it's quite innovative, even if, if they are starting from what already exists. Then we'll also compare this new approach with the previous one. As it should have been conducted uh, as it was planned, I would say, but also it is often actually understood because you will see that there is some misunderstood uh, understanding about the approach. Also, we'll bring the light uh, to light the benefits of this new, this new approach, which is especially interesting for limited resource countries. The uh, fourth objective is to stimulate further interest, and I hope you will be interested, and also prepare you for practical workshop to be organized in the future. I really hope that that will be possible in the future, uh, uh, despite the limitation, current limitation due to COVID. So your learning objectives for this uh, webinar is first to become able to explain the importance of risk assessment to implement adapted by risk management. Then you should also know and be able to explain the principles and steps of the new approach. And last, uh, you should also understand and be able to explain the interest of this new approach versus the classical one. And the next step that will be during the future practical workshop will be to become able to use this new approach on, on, on different situations that you know in your facilities. So the content of the series, uh, we have four sessions and uh, the dates are already planned. The first one today will be on the classical approach. I will start explaining how uh, we should do the risk assessment now. Then the second one will be uh, really presenting the new WHO approach, uh, WHO approach, why they developed it and how it worked. Session three will be devoted to uh, the WHO approach 
WHO approach, but on a more practical point of view. So we'll try to use it. Of course, I cannot, we cannot have a real workshop, uh, but I will case, uh, we'll start from a few case studies that are presented in the WHO manual. And the last session on June 23rd will be on question and answers. And so as said by Paria, if you have questions, please write them in the chat box and we'll make sure that we answer them either during this session or possibly at the end during that last session. So, as I said, today I will present you the classical approach. Why do I do that? First, because some of you may be familiar with the classical approach and it will be easier to jump into the new approach if you already know the one which is in place now. Also because it will uh, allow me to uh, introduce a number of concepts that are also used in the new approach. And also to understand the, 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 the advantage of the new approach, you should also know how it was before. And so this is why I, I start uh, and spend one session on the classical approach. So uh, why do we do a biological risk assessment? Actually, we do that one situation is not equivalent to another. Biological activities are extremely diverse. We have we use a variety of different biological agents and materials, bacteria, viruses, and so on, of different types. We also use GMOs, and all those GMOs could be different. Uh, we have different types of activities like diagnostic research, possibly development of new techniques, and also production of vaccines, for instance. And then we have different disciplines: microbiology, molecular biology, uh, and, 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 and many others. Also, uh, laboratory activities uh, in this field are particularly complex and there are diff many different uh, activities and protocols that can be used. Also, we don't work in the same environment. There are different infrastructures, some well-equipped, some much less equipped. Also, the type of equipment that is used, it can be very different. And also, we work in different institutions and so we, we are confronted to different contexts and, and different operational means. Uh, for instance, logistics can, can be more or less important. Also, the, the financial means that help putting in place a number of measures can be extremely different from one situation to another. So, because of all that, the nature and level of risk may, may differ considerably. It can be quite different from one activity to the other, also for the same type of activity from one institution to the other. So, the purpose of risk assessment is to ensure a level of protection adapted to the nature and level of risk of the activity. So that's really the purpose of risk assessment. We don't put measures of protection just like that. We really want them to be adapted to what we do, to the nature and level of risk of what we do. This is just to illustrate a number of different domains, activities that we do in biological labs. You can see that they are totally different. And of course, the, the level of risk could be also very different uh, between those, those different activities. Another example, you see two very different activities here. The first one is solid culture at a laboratory scale, uh, scale so meaning we handle milliliters or microliters. In that case, it's also cultures, uh, solid culture and, and at very small scale, I would say. On the other picture, you see a, a bioreactor or a biofermenter, and that's a closed system. But there we can uh, we can produce like 5,000 5, liters of, 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 for instance, concentrated bacteria or virus. Of course, this is totally different. The situation is different, the measures will need, the risk is different, and so the measures will need to be different. Also, if I show you these four different pictures that are very different, I would like to ask you the question, are, are all these situations equally safe? You might have different opinions on that, but my answer to that, they say, yes, they are equally safe, or at least they should be equally safe. So they should be equally safe, provided the control measures that are in place, from the simples on the left-hand side to the uh, most sophisticated on the right-hand side, are adapted to the activity and the nature and level of risk. On the left picture, for instance, you see that that person does not have wear any protective equipment or anything. She does a very basic activity, very, very low risk, just taking notes uh, and handling closed tubes. On the opposite, on the third picture, for instance, and also in the second picture, 
they are pipetting and so they are using liquids and that's not a closed system it's not in a tube anymore and then the the, the last picture is uh, is something which is much more protected why because the level of the nature and the level of risk are, are much more important so actually, there is no, not just one way to do things. We need to find the right measures to put in place according to the risk assessment we do. We should also insist, uh, I should also insist on the fa fact that those different pictures illustrate situations that involve very different costs and logistic means. Well, the first one is, very, is totally cheap, non-expensive. Well, the, the most sophisticated system is extremely expensive. And so we should, since we are, we always have limited resources, but in some institutions and some countries more than in others, we always need to pay attention to those resources and to take that into consideration. So why should we put too high measures if they cut all of, of money and if they are not necessary? So why do we do a risk, a biological risk assessment? The main purpose is to define the preventive measures adapted to the nature and level of risk. So that's really the purpose of risk assessment. But we also do that for management purpose, for the sound allocation of the resource for, to the most appropriate measures. We don't want to spend resources blindly. We want to put the resources, put the protection means where they are the most needed. So it's really a management tool for that. And this aspect is even more, more critical in uh, limited resource settings. If you lack some financial means, and logistic means and so on, you need to be sure that the few you have are put at the right place. So now as a conclusion, biological risk assessment is a basic requirement for sound virus management, but it's also a resource management tool. And managers from an institution, they will like to see good results of a risk assessment because they will know where they had to, to, to act in priority. Also, it's a basic uh, legal requirement in countries that have biosafety regulations. It's a case in, in many Western countries, we have biosafety regulation, and those biosafety regulations are always based on a risk assessment. So what is risk? Risk is actually a combination of a likelihood of exposure or release with the severity of the consequence of that exposure or release if it would occur. So it's really a function of likely, likelihood and consequence. And this can be illustrated by what we call a risk assessment matrix. You see uh, on, um, on the horizontal side, you see that you have the likelihood of exposure from low on the left to high on the right and then uh, you have the consequences of, of exposure uh, low for uh, low concern weak consequence high consequence at the top and you see that matrix and you see that in that matrix that at the, at the upper right corner hand you have a very high level of risk why if the likelihood is very low and also the consequences are uh, are uh, weak in that case you have a very low risk this helps a lot in defining where we need to put the efforts so for instance if you have a number of activities and some of those, acti those activities have a, a high likelihood of exposure or release and also the consequences of those exposure or release would be very high in that case you would be in that red area that's where we need to act in priority and then we would act on the orange part and the yellow parts and so on and there is some place there where we could accept okay this risk is low because the likelihood likelihood is low and also the consequences are low so perhaps we can accept this what is going on there okay this is a risk management strategy strategy based on risk assessment. We need first to know the activity, so to describe the activity. Then we do the biological risk assessment, and when we ask ourselves the question, is the risk acceptable or not? Can we accept to live with this risk, or do we need to do something? If we can accept the risk, then we, we can proceed with work and implement the control measures as defined and so on. If not, we need to add some more protective measures and do, and again, look at the activity, do the biological risk assessment, 
and again ask in this case is it sufficient okay so it's a kind of there is a possibility to continuously adapt and improve in a, in a system like this to finish this first part uh, one word about risk acceptance actually if we if we go back biological risk assessment there is a methodology we try to base our assessment on facts data so on on, on a number of things that are we can on information that we can find uh, so on, on it's more or less it, it, it's a rather technical and scientific work at the end when we did could we ask, accept this risk in that case it becomes more, much more subjective it's also linked to culture and and there, there is a different in culture between the different regions of the world but also be, between the different time if you see on the left hand side those people who are having the picnic on the top of a building they are uh, they are constructing i mean they have no protection at all they are taking a huge risk there when you see uh, on the right you see that people now uh, they have uh, at least in, in most western countries they have complete protection equipment but you see that in some part of the world they are still working without any protection and so and, and it is accepted like that the people who like that they don't complain about that the risk is accepted like that so there is a, quite a lot of difference that can be linked to individuals to regions and also to the, to, to the moment on the right hand side you also see the way we drive a bike in in western countries and how uh, they drive a bike in in southeast asia for instance the perception of risk is totally different there uh, and and of course if for instance the, the, the person who is on a motorbike driving kids to school after that goes to, to work in a lab perhaps it's likely that, uh, that, that the, per the perception of risk by that person will be different from from someone who's uh, really used to, have, to being exposed to almost no risk i won't insist a lot on, about that but still defining if risk is acceptable or not is a very important point and we need to know that it is uh, uh, something which is quite subjective so now it's time to handle the floor to uh, Afsa for a summary in Urdu, and I will see if there are a few questions I might be able to understand. Uh, I, want, I might have time to understand now, or if we'll keep it for for the last session. So Afsa. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Philip, for uh, uh, this nice presentation. Urdu summary. So, Hayati Ati Khatrat Ki Janchini Biological Risk Assessment. इस सिलसिले के पहले वेबिनार के पहले हिस्से में आपको फिलिप ने रिस्क एसेसमेंट के मुस्तानेज यानी क्लासिकल तरीके के तरीके कार के बारे में बताया. और अब सवाल ये पैदा होता है कि हमें बायोलॉजिकल खतरा की जांच की जरूरत क्यों पड़ती है क्योंकि बायोलॉजिकल लेबोरेटरीज में बहुत मुख्तलिफ किस्म के काम किए जाते हैं मसलन अद्वियात या वैक्सीन की पैदावार रिसर्च बीमारियों की तशखीस और तदरीसी अमल के तजर्बा इसके अलावा लेबॉटरीओं की साख मशीनरी केमिकल्स और कई किस्म की सहूलियात एक दूसरे से मुख्तलिफ हो सकती हैं इसी तरह जो हयातियाती मादा यानी बायोलॉजिकल एजेंट्स या बायोलॉजिकल मटीरियल इस्तेमाल किए जाते हैं आ, उसकी नोयत भी मुख्तलिफ उसकी बिना पर भी मुख्तलिफ खतरा की नोयत मुख्तलिफ हो सकती है जैसे माइक्रोबायोलॉजी के खतरा मोलिकुलर बायोलॉजी के खतरा से बिल्कुल मुख्तलिफ होते हैं इसके अलावा बायोलॉजिकल मटीरियल की कितनी मकदार इस्तेमाल की जा रही है इसकी बिना पर भी खतरा मुख्तलिफ हो सकते हैं इन तमाम मुख्तलिफ हालात को मद्देनजर रखते हुए खतरे की नोयत और उसके दर्जात की एक वसी पैमाने दर्जात को एक वसी पैमाने का सामना किया जा सकता है और इसी बुनियाद पर हमें खतरे की जांच करनी होती है जिसमें मजमू हालात के मुताबिक तहफ़ को यकीनी बनाए जा सकने के मुतालिक इकदाम किए जाते हैं इस जांच पड़ताल का एक और अहम मकसद ये है कि महदूद वसाइल के अंदर रहते हुए भी तहफ़ के फराहम को यकीनी बनाया जाए अब खतरे को अच्छे तरीके से जानना भी बहुत इम्पोर्टेंट है बहुत ज़रूरी है खतरा मरकब है बेसिकली दो चीज़ों का किसी अन चाहे वाक्य के हो जाने के इम्कान और उसके मुमकिन नतज का यानी लाइकलीहुड और कॉन्सिक्वेंसेस आपने जांचना है कि आपको किसी तजर्बे के दौरान कितना खतरा है और क्या वो खतरा आपके लिए काबिल कबूल है या नहीं इसके लिए आप देखते हैं कि अगर कोई शख्स इस खतरे की जद में आ जाए तो इम्कान कम ज़्यादा या बहुत ज़्यादा हो सकते हैं 
और इस सूरत में नतज किस हद तक संगीन हो सकते हैं और इसी जांच की बुनियाद पर आप तय करते हैं कि आपका काम कितना खतरनाक हो सकता है और इस खतरे की कबूलियत यानी एक्सेप्टेंस मुख्तलिफ इलाकों और अलग अलग कल्चर्स के लिए मुख्तलिफ हो सकती है जैसे कि अगर आप इस इन तस्वीर में देखें और इनमें जो नजर आने वाले मनाजिर हैं वो कुछ मुल्कों में दूसरे मुल्कों की नस्बत ज्यादा नजर आते हैं जैसे कि आप इस बाइक पे पांच छह पूरी फैमिली को सफर करते हुए देख सकते हैं इस किस्म के मनाजिर आप पाकिस्तान जैसे मुल्क में अक्सर देख लेते हैं लेकिन वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज में इस किस्म के इस किस्म के मनाजिर आपको अमूमन नजर नहीं आते शुक्रिया ओवर टू फिलअप फॉर द नेक्स्ट पार्ट Thank you very much, Atsa. I see that there are no questions, uh, probably because the introduction, and so it's not yet very technical. So I guess that questions will come will come later. So, uh, I see. So now I will present you the classical risk assessment. Um, so, uh, first, what is biological risk assessment? A definition can be that it's an, ev an evaluation of the likelihood that biological agents or materials involved in a given activity will generate some harm to the personal, the community, or the environment, and also a, a, an evaluation of the severity of that harm in order to define appropriate risk control measures. And so when we do when we think about biological risk assessment we always need to take into consideration the likelihood of an, ev an event like uh, exposure or, or release and also the severity of that, expo uh, co that uh, the consequence of that exposure or uh, or release also we also co uh, always consider the possible harm to the personnel so the people who work in the lab but also to the community and the environment So finally, biological risk assessment deals with activities that involve some biological agents and materials. But first, we need to know the hazardousness uh, of those biological agents. So actually, uh, the uh, risk assessment is a two-step process, and this is very much the way it is done in the classical uh, risk assessment methodology. So the first step, Uh, during the first step, we only look at the biological agents or materials. We and that's the uh, we do a hazard identification and characterizations. What does it mean? That means that we define all the characteristic of the biological agents or materials uh, that are relevant to their pathogenicity, to their infectiousness, and so on. And we def define the hazard that may represent for the personnel, the community, and the environment. So the first step, we only look at the biological agents or materials. Then once we know that, we look at what we do with those biological agents or materials, and we do a risk analysis of the activity. And during that risk analysis, we do an evaluation of the risk of exposure, infection, and other harm uh, that biological agents or materials may cause to the personnel, the community, or the environment. So it's really a two-step uh, approach, but which is based on, on two terms that I use, hazard and risk. And most of the time, in most languages, we use one word for the other. There is no real, we don't make a, a big difference between the two words. Actually, in the fields of safety, we do make a difference between hazard and risk. So hazard is defined as the intrinsic ability to cause adverse effects, harm. And so, for instance, we speak about a hazardous substance, okay? While risk is the likelihood that those adverse events will occur during a given activity or in given circumstances. And so we'll more speak more about a risky situation or activity. So in safety and in biosafety, we, we tend to make the difference between the two terms. And we can illustrate this with an example. Uh, there is a tiger there. That tiger is a, a dangerous animal. That animal could really attack us or uh, ourselves. Uh, us uh, and it could kill us really so it's highly hazardous i would say if we do those two different situations uh, uh the, the the hazard is still there i mean the lion is always as uh, the, the tiger is always as, as uh, dangerous 
But on the left uh, picture, you see that there is no barrier or anything. So it could really jump on us. In a cage, the hazard is still there, but the risk becomes very low because in that case, it cannot provoke, provoke any harm to us because, uh, because of that cage, okay? You see also that the risk may differ uh, over time. In this case, the tiger is escaping from the cage. So immediately the risk that was close to zero when the cage was closed, at one point the cage is open, and in that case, the risk become ex immediately extremely high. In a lab, that could be the situation where we handle some uh, liquids in, in some closed containers, and we drop the container, and there is a major spill. While the liquids were in the container, there was no risk, but we drop it, there is a spill, and then we could be exposed. So you see, hazard is really a kind of potential of harm, while risk is really the situation, uh, the likelihood that that harm will present, and that's really linked to the situation. So, uh, as I said, uh, biological risk assessment is a two-step process. First, we look only at biological agent to do a hazard identification and characterization. And then once we have that, we, uh, we do the risk analysis of the activity. And so on the graph I presented to you before, I, in this case, I spread the, the two steps of high risk uh, assessment. So I will first, of course, uh, explain you the step one. And so uh, for hazard identification and characterization, we focus on the biological agents or materials only. Um, for that, we do two main things. The first thing we, we do is we define all their relevant characteristics like biological mechanism, stability, transmission, survival, trans, uh, transmission modes, and, and, and also the medical aspects. And we define the potential harm they may cause in case of dissemination or exposure. Okay. Then we also, and that's uh, the second part, we also try to evaluate the level of hazard. And that's more difficult to do, I would say. And what we use, we use a classification into one to four hazard groups. Uh, actually, I use hazard groups because it should be the right term, but you will see that in many papers, including in the WHO laboratory by Setumal, they speak about risk groups. So on this slide, I took a number of ex elements of, of that hazard characterization. So we need to look at all the all the features that may have an impact on the on the level of hazard and the nature of the hazard that all those biological agents may present. So of course, all the biological characteristics uh, and that includes morphology dimensions, which can be important for filter sensor, but also the replication and reproduction mode, life cycle for more complex organisms, genetic stability, which is important. Are there different subtypes or subgroups? Also, uh, is, is, are there frequent mutations and so on? And then we also look at survival modes. What, what are the, the chances of survival uh, in the environment? Very important also is the infectious potential for, uh, for humans, animals, and plants. Uh, what is the virulence? And that is more, uh, most generally trans, uh, translated to infectious dose. The infectious dose is the minimum dose that is sufficient to infect someone or some animals or some plant. If we know, if you have that information, it's something that is very useful, of course. We know if it, we, if it can be easily infected with a low dose or if we only need a high dose to be infected. Then transmissibility and transmission modes, very important. How is it transmitted? So does, does it use the airborne route, like uh, for respiratory disease? or do we have to ingest it, or is it mostly by mucosal contact or blood contact and so on? This is also very important. And then we look also at the uh, more medical aspects about the infection. What is the pathology? What are the, uh, the, the signs and symptoms? What are the, the severity of those symptoms? Are there some asymptomatic cases or latent infection and those are those asymptomatic cases, can, can they transmit the infection? What is the incubation period? During uh, how long uh, is an infected person infectious? And then we can we look also at the possible complication. How severe is the disease? Are there some chronic long-term effects? What is the mortality rate? And so on. 
There are some other medical aspects that are important. So for the, the availability, availability of, of diagnostic, also of medical prevention, such as vaccines or treatment means, uh, like drugs, for instance. We also look at all the epidemiology of the, the biological agent. So the geographical distribution, is it endemic to this region or not? What is the incidence in the population or the prevalence? What is do, do they cause outbreaks? Is it something that could become uh, cause a major outbreak that, that could become a, a pandemic in some case? And you also look at the history of laboratory acquired infections. We also look at survival and dissemination. I'm not, uh, I mentioned the resistance in the environment and what are the possibilities of survive being there, but also of colonizing some part of the environment for bacteria, for instance. Then the host range, are there some animal vectors, natural reservoirs, and so on. And very important also, what is the resistance to physical uh, uh, parameters, for instance, to heat, to uh, uh, dry atmosphere, to pH, and also to chemicals like disinfectants. And this is very important for the measures. And then we, could, uh, we can also look at, at the possible impact for public health, for the environment, and also for uh, the social and economic life, especially for, for instance, for animal diseases and so on. So we have to look at a number of different qualitative data. How we do that? We, we need to find the information. And so the two first, uh, the, there are some, uh, some websites that provide some very good, uh, reliable biosafety information on a number of, of, of classical uh, uh, biological agents. One is in Canada, the other is in the US. And if, if you want to have a kind of summary, it's very easy to, to use those sites and you can find information there. But if the biological agent you are working on is not in those documents, in that case, you need to, to do some literature review in order to find all the information that uh, I mentioned before and that is useful to, to, to some way define uh, the hazard. After having that qualitative information, we classify uh, the different biological agents in four hazard groups. That, and those hazard groups, they reflect the global level of hazard. It's quite artificial. And, and actually, uh, we might have different perception of that and so on, but the, those classifications exist and it is uh, artificial. It is artificial to classify all different biological agents in only four hazard groups with limits. Still, we try to be as objective as possible in doing that, and so we use uh, a number of criteria. The first one is probably the most important, is the degree of pathogenicity. Does it cause a severe disease or not? And what is the extent of that severity? Then we look at the level of hazard for directly exposed individuals, like for instance, the people working in the lab, and then the level of hazard for the community or the environment. So that's in case of dissemination. And the main difference between the two is how easily they are transmitted from one person to another or from one animal to another. So that's mostly linked to transmissibility and the epidemiology. And then the, the fourth criteria is, uh, our, is the availability of good medical prevention or medical treatment means. Based on those four criteria, we can classify all those all, all biological agents in four hazard groups. And this is in some way a, a summary of that. You see that the four hazard groups. Hazard group one is, uh, is, is for biological agents that are not pathogenic, that do not cause any disease for healthy individuals. So the hazard level is, is, is zero or extremely low. And so the level of hazard for the community is zero. And we don't need to apply uh, any uh, medication or so because it, because it's, it's not hazardous. Hazard group two is for uh, pathogens that could cause low to moderate, moderate disease. So the level of hazard for the individual is low to moderate. And uh, consider that the risk for the hazard for the community is low. In that case, most of the time, Time, sorry. At the time, uh, there are some uh, vaccines or some, uh, um, some some drugs that are available. As a group three, in that case, uh, it's for uh, agents that cause serious disease. 
the level of, of, of hazard for the individual is higher. And also, in that case, uh, most of those organisms are also uh, present also a higher level of hazard for the community, meaning that are easily transmit, uh, transmit that, can, that could cause some uh, epidemic clusters and so on. And in that case, there are not always good prevention or uh, medical prevention or medical treatment means. Hazard group four is the, for the most uh, dangerous uh, agent that causes a very severe disease, uh, very high level of hazard for the individual, also high for the community and no good vac uh, vaccination or, or treatment means. Typically, that's like uh, Ebola, for instance. So how do we classify biological agents into four hazard groups? Actually, uh, there are for most, or if not for most of the classical strains, there are some official lists that are published by a number of authorities. And I took a few examples here. Those are can easily be found in on the internet. And so it's it's easy if you work on some agent, you can go into those lists and see how they are classified. Just one remark about that. All these lists are made in, um, are developed in, in West, Western countries, where the epidemiological situation is totally different from the fact. So the, the situation may be totally different in, in, uh, in Pakistan, and even if you only look at the biological agent, it might have an impact. For instance, uh, we, in Western countries, we might classify an organism very high because the people here are not immune, they are not protected because some, it's some exotic disease which is not present here. While in Pakistan, it might be something which is endemic, which is part, which is here in the population. And so in that case, perhaps Pakistan will classify it lower, with a lower hazard. Also, the medical needs are a bit different. Uh, in our countries, we have quite a lot of medical means available. And so because of that, we might classify some organisms at a lower level than you would do in Pakistan, because you might lack some of those medical needs. For biological agents that are not on the list, uh, that are not classical strains, like variants, like some attenuated strains of viruses, for instance, like all the genetically modified strains, like cell lines, in that case, we need to, to collect all the information and to, provide, to as, uh, ascribe a hazard group ourselves. And we can do that in comparing with the classical strains that we usually know better. So that's, that was clearly the first step. So we only looked at the biological agent to identify the hazard and characterize the hazard. Now we are moving to step two, where we look at the, uh, at the activity and do the risk analysis of the activity. How do we proceed to do that? First, we, we need to define in some way the limits of the activity. And if it's a large activity, uh, we can divide it into steps. Or, or processes, uh, and that's that's up to us to define what, uh, how we will uh, kind of uh, divide the activity if it's a very complex one. Then for the activity or all the steps and process of the activity, we identify all the events that may lead to either a personal exposure of the people working in the lab, or a release or a dissemination in the community or the environment. And we do that in looking how we work normally when everything goes right, according to the procedures, for instance, but also in case of failure. We also consider, okay, at this stage, for instance, we could cause a spill. What would be, uh, uh, so the spill is an event, and in that case, we might have a very different exposure, for instance, okay? Then for all these events, we evaluate the likelihood of occurrence. So is a spill in that situation, is this something which is highly likely to occur? Is that something that could happen like every weeks or two weeks? Or is it something that's going to barely happen perhaps once a year? Or is it something that well, it won't happen? It's almost impossible that it happened. So we need to evaluate the likelihood of occurrence. 
And we also, and then we also need to evaluate the impact. If, for instance, the laboratory, uh, a laboratory uh, worker is exposed to, to this uh, agent during that activity, what will be the consequence for his or her health? Also, if we have a problem at that level and there is a dissemination outside of the lab, what would be the consequences for the population or for the environment? Understood. Okay, and we do that. So we do those, those four activities to establish a risk class for the activity. So we had the hazard group of the biological agent. We establish a risk class for the activity and associate the risk class of the activity. We define a number of control measures. Also, we need to define whether the risk is acceptable or not. So when uh, doing the risk analysis, there are a number of activities that, uh, of, of factors that we need to consider. I will not go through this, uh, just but I perhaps insist on a few on a few ones. Nature of purpose of the activity, for instance, is in, in diagnostic, we use most of the time always the same type of procedures and so on, while in R&D, the research and development, we tend to develop new approaches all the time. So that may put people in a very different situation. Um, of course, we use different techniques and so on. We use different concentration and scale. The, impact, the, the importance of scale is obvious. If we have thousands of liters, it's totally different from having microliters. But concentration is very important. At the end of a culture of a bacteria or a virus, we might end up with uh, concentrations that are a million times higher than in nature. And so, of course, if you get exposed to this, the likelihood of, of, of becoming infected is extremely high. And then there are some other aspects. I also want to point out that there are some human factors there, like the knowledge of the process, uh, the control of the process by the workers, like the experience of the workers, for instance, to all those are really uh, human factors. And then we look at, uh, to look at, we need to look at the emergent situation, at waste management and so on. Also, if we do risk assessment, most of the time, we already have a, a lab which is working, okay? And so if you come with a new technique or a new uh, biological agent in that lab, uh, in that case, you will evaluate, you will assess the activity, the risk of the activity in looking at the current situation of the lab. And so in that case, you might end up with a situation, okay, the way we work in the lab is sufficient to control that risk, uh, but in some other case, we need to add some, some more measures to really control the risk. So if we, among the factors that we use for the risk analysis, we consider the measures that are, the control measures that are already in place. Examples of at-risk activities and operations, I will not go into detail either, just point out a few things. First, uh, all the activities that could generate aerosols, they are a, a really at-risk activity. Why? Because with aerosols, they, they will expand the contamination in the whole lab and we could also be directly exposed. So that's very important. Other aspect I want to stress on also is work with animals. Uh, we cannot always predict and control the, the reactions of animal. And so there is also an additional level of risk. And then also some maintenance activities, for instance, because the people who do maintenance are not familiar with the lab. So um, transport could be also a, 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 a net risk activity if packaging is not done properly. But so you need to, 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 to look at all those activities and, uh, and, and really try to assess what is, uh, how does it work in your situation. Okay, now when we have done the biological risk assessment, which is a part which is uh, squared in red there, step one, uh, as I grouped and uh, uh, definition and characterization, and then a risk class of the activity, that allows to define the biosafety level and the risk control measures, okay? One thing I want to point out in, in, in this is that it's not just the hazard group of the biological agents that define the biosafety level, but the risk class of the activity. And this is something that was not well understood, that is not well understood by, by many people in the current system. Many people think that if they have a hazard group a three biological agent, they need a BSL3 lab. 
this, this is not true. It depends on what they do with that other co two bi uh, three biological agent. If they can control the risk at a lower level, in that case, they will classify the activity at a lower level and they don't need a BSL-3, but they could work, for instance, in a BSL-2 or even in a BSL-1. So that's what I'm saying here. So in general, the hazard group of the agents defines the risk class of the activity, and that defines the required biosafety level. But there are many, many cases, many instances where it doesn't work that way. And I, among those different examples, I just took two. The first one is for uh, laboratory work on HIV. HIV is a hazard group three biological agent. And so if we do diagnostic, diagnostic or research work on HIV, including some culture on, on, on cell lines, for instance, we can do that at, a, at BSL-2 level. We don't need a BSL-3, despite it's a hazard group 3 agent. Why? Because using good microbiological practices and BSL-2 practice is enough to ensure a very good risk control. One important aspect because of the risk of transmission to blood, for instance, to uh, percutaneous exposure, is to strictly limit sharps. If you can do that, and you can do that in your BSL-2, why would you need a BSL-3 structure? And so that's really the, log the logic that was applied already to the old technique of uh, to the current uh, to the classical method of, of uh, risk assessment. The opposite example is, uh, for instance, the large-scale uh, culture of, of uh, pertussis, so open cuff for vaccine production. And despite the fact it's a hazard group, two uh, biological agent is done. It's usually done at PSL3. Why? Because when we analyze the risk of the activity, we we know already that the agent is transmissible by air and is quite resistant, I would say, quite easily transmissible. But if we work with a large volume of bacteria at a very high concentration at the end of containment, in that case, any incident with the fermenters would expose people to very high concentration and so on, and also would possibly, possibly uh, cause a dissemination outside of the lab. And because of that, the activity is classified as risk with uh, class three activity, and that's done at the BSL-3 level. So to, to end this part, just a few things to remember. First, that risk assessment is really needed. It's very important for sound and sustainable risk management. Why sustainable? Because uh, all the measures we can put in place have a cost, and we need to really do risk assessment to know exactly where and what we need to fit as measures. Then the classical risk assessment methodology, the, know that you, the, the one that you probably know of or have heard about, is a two-step process where we first define the hazard of the biological agent and then evaluate the risk of the activity. And so that means that we need to know both the agent and the activity quite well, very well, I would say. So most of the time, risk assessment is not something that we do alone in an office, for instance. It's mostly a team exercise, or at least different people bring their input. Then very important, biosafety levels uh, are not based on the agent, but on the risk of the activity. And that's, that makes it different. And this is something that is not well understood in the current system. Many people uh, do not under, do not apply this, do not do not understand this, and this is one of the reasons why WHO decided to change the system. Then uh, the last point is that risk assessment itself is, is systematic and to be based on facts and data, but risk accept acceptance is more subjective. The impact of that is that we need some kind of review of risk assessment, and and some of you have attended some uh, workshops and, and webinars on uh, institutional biosafety committees. Clearly, it's one of the roles of, of uh, one part of the mission of of the biosafety uh, institutional biosafety committee to uh, review the risk assessment, to approve the risk assessment, but also to define what can be accepted as risk. So this is true. Uh, this is all for for this part. So uh, Afsa, could you please also do the summer here? Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Philip.
سو پریزنٹیشن کے دوسرے حصے میں فلپ نے آپ کو خطرات کی جانچ کے کلاسیکل طریقے کے بارے میں بتایا ہے اور حیاتی حیاتیاتی خطرات کی جانچ میں خاص طور پر ان خطرات کو مد نظر رکھا جاتا ہے جن کا تعلق بایولوجیکل مٹیریل سے ہو اور وہ انسانوں اور ان کے ماحول کو نقصان پہنچا سکتے ہوں اب ہیزرڈ اور رسک کے فرق کو سمجھنا بھی بہت ضروری ہے ہیزرڈ اس چیز کو کہتے ہیں جو کہ نقصان پہنچانے کی صلاحیت رکھتی ہو جب کہ رسک نقصان پہنچانے کے امکانات کے بارے میں اس رسک کے ٹرم کو استعمال کیا جاتا ہے بایولوجیکل رسک اسسمنٹ کا کلاسیکل طریقہ دو حصوں پر مشتمل ہے اور جو کہ خطرے کو پہچاننے کے لیے استعمال کیا جاتا ہے پہلا مرحلہ یہ کہ آپ نے خطرے کو یعنی ہیزرڈ کو پہچاننا ہے اور دوسرے حصے میں یہ جانچ کی جاتی ہے کہ اگر بایولوجیکل مٹیریل کے ساتھ کام کرنے والا شخص اس کی زد میں آ جاتا ہے تو اس کے نقصانات کس نوعیت کے ہو سکتے ہیں اور دوسرے لوگوں کو اور ماحول کو کس حد تک ان نقصانات سے متاثر ہو سکنے کا خطرہ ہو سکتا ہے اب اگر اس کی تفصیل میں جائیں تو پہلا مرحلہ یعنی ہیزرڈ آئیڈینٹیفکیشن ہیزرڈ کی شناخت اور اس کی پہچان ہے جس میں بایو ہیزرڈ کے حیاتیاتی خصوصیات اور اس کے ممکنہ نقصانات پر غور کیا جاتا ہے اس سلسلے میں اس کی مختلف اقسام اس سے ہونے والی بیماری اس کی منتقلی کے ذرائع انکیوبیشن کا عرصہ اس کی تشخیص اور علاج ممکنہ ہوسٹ جس میں وہ بیماری پیدا کر سکتا ہو ویکسین کی موجودگی اس سے ہو سکنے والی اموات کی شرح عوام کو اس سے درپیش مسائل خطرات اور ماحول کو لاحق ہو جانے والے خطرات بھی اس میں شامل ہیں ان تمام چیزوں کا جائزہ لینے کے بعد کسی بھی بایولوجیکل مٹیریل کو آپ مختلف گروپس میں ڈال سکتے ہیں ان گروپس کو ہیزرڈ گروپ کہا جاتا ہے عموماً چار ہیزرڈ گروپس ہوتے ہیں اور ان کی تقسیم کی جاتی ہے بایولوجیکل مٹیریل کی ان چار گروپس میں اور یہ تقسیم کے مختلف کرائٹیریا ہیں جیسے کہ ہیزرڈ گروپ ون میں وہ جراثیم آ جاتے ہیں جو کہ لوگوں کو بیمار نہیں کر سکتے یا جن کے علاج مولجے وغیرہ کی ضرورت نہیں ہوتی جبکہ دوسری طرف اگر آپ ہیزرڈ گروپ فور کو دیکھتے ہیں تو اس میں آنے والے جراثیم انتہائی خطرناک ہو سکتے ہیں نہ صرف اس شخص کے لیے جو کہ اس کی زد میں آ جائے بلکہ اس شخص کے لیے بھی جو اس شخص کے ساتھ کمیونٹی میں ایگزٹ کرتے ہیں سروائو کرتے ہیں یعنی عوام الناس کے لیے بھی یہ جراثیم خطرناک ہو سکتے ہیں اور اس کے نتیجے میں ہو سکنے والی بیماری سے بچنے کا کوئی طریقہ یا کوئی علاج ممکن نہیں ہوتا عموماً اس سلسلے میں مزید معلومات کے لیے فلپ نے آپ کو کچھ مستند حوالہ جات بھی فراہم کیے ہیں اور یہ تنبیہ کیے کہ ہر علاقے ہر علاقہ اپنے حالات اور واقعات اور وسائل کی روشنی میں اپنے لیے ہیزرڈ گروپ کی صحیح تقسیم بنائے اس کلاسیکل طریقے کے دوسرے مرحلے میں وہ رسک کی ترقی کی جاتی ہے جو کہ خاص کر اس کام سے تعلق رکھتی ہے جو آپ نے بایولوجیکل مٹیریل کے ساتھ کرنا ہے اس کے لیے آپ نے اس بات کا تجزیہ کرنا ہوگا کہ آپ کے کام یا تجربے کے کس کس مرحلے کے دوران کس کس قسم کا خطرہ لاحق ہو سکتا ہے اور اس کے امکانات کتنے ہیں تاکہ آپ یہ طے کر سکیں کہ کیا آپ یہ خطرہ مول لے سکتے ہیں یا نہیں اس جانچ کے لیے جن عناصر کو زیر غور لانا ہے ان کی چند مثالیں ہیں جیسے کہ کام کی نوعیت اس کے لیے درکار مشینری یا آلات موجودہ وسائل کام کرنے والے کا علم تجربہ اور متعلقہ تربیت کسی ہنگامی صورتحال سے نمٹنے کے لیے موجودہ رہنمائی اصول وغیرہ اس جانچ کی بنیاد پر کلاسیکل طریقے میں بایو سیفٹی لیول طے کیا جاتا ہے تاکہ خطرات کو کم سے کم کیا جا سکے اور یہ بایولوجیکل سیفٹی لیول بایولوجیکل مٹیریل کی بنیاد پر نہیں بلکہ اس کام کی بنیاد پر بنائے جاتے ہیں جو 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 اس بایولوجیکل مٹیریل کے ساتھ کیا جانا ہے جیسے کہ انتہائی خطرناک جراثیم جیسے ایچ آئی وی کے ساتھ بی ایس ایل ٹو میں کام کرنا جو کہ انتہائی خطرناک ہو سکتا ہے لیکن اگر اس کو جی ایم پی پی کے رہنما اصولوں کے مطابق اور انتہائی احتیاط کے ساتھ کیا جائے تو پھر آپ اپنے آپ کو بچا سکتے ہیں اس ساری بات کا حتمی نتیجہ یہ ہے کہ حیاتیاتی خطرات کی جانچ ضروری ہے تاکہ ہمیشہ ان خطرات سے بچا جا سکے چاہے وہ جراثیم ہو یا ان کے ساتھ کام کیے جانے والے تجربات کے ساتھ ہوں اور یہ کہ کلاسیکل طریقہ کار میں استعمال کیے جانے والے بائی سیفٹی لیول کی بنیاد جراثیم کے بجائے ان کے ساتھ کیے جانے والے کام پر تھی لیکن یہ جانچ ایک بہت اہم کام ہے جس کے لیے ایک تربیت یافتہ ٹیم کی ضرورت ہے تاکہ محدود وسائل کے ساتھ بھی کام کیا جا سکے اور اس صورت حال میں آئی بی سی جیسی ٹیمس کا رول بہت زیادہ اہمیت کا حامل ہے تھینک یو سو مچ
अगर आपके कोई सवाल आते हैं तो आप कर सकते हैं हेलो हेलो ओके there are a few questions but some of the questions uh, are addressed to the organizer so we'll let them answer to that there are just two questions addressed more mostly to me uh, the, the one is, is private but uh, I, don't, i don't see why it's private so okay. the question is uh, what about uh, uh, risk assessment if we don't have a, a, a biosafety committee actually you don't need Uh, uh, biosafety committee to do the risk assessment. The, the risk assessment should be done by the people working in the lab with the biosafety officer or with someone who is knowledgeable about the biosafety. And that, that's the supervision. And of course, of course, but, but that's, that's uh, more discussion about the organization and so on. We might have time to do that during the last session but you don't necessarily need a, a, a biosafety committee to, to, to do the risk assessment people working in the lab with their supervisors they can do the job uh, the other question is very interesting but I think that's really for the last session it's about uh, it's about human factors that uh, when things are in place some people tend to become more and more relaxed with the measures in place uh, especially with respect to COVID I think I prefer not to answer this now because uh, because you will see that perhaps this is better taken into consideration in the new approach by WHO. And so, if this question is still not clear after uh, session two and three, in that case, uh, we can discuss that a little bit more. So, perhaps the organizer for the for the to the few other questions. Yes. No, one of the question was uh, one of the question was about uh, the, the recording of the session. Is it available? Uh, that I don't know exactly, but uh, in, in any case, the presentation itself, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint, will be available in PDF. But I think that the recording should be available also. But please, Pepsa, confirm this. Uh, uh, yes, Philippe, the recording will be available and it will be sent to all the participants. Oh, very good, excellent. So I think it's about time to close this session. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and participation. Uh, I, I would like to ask them. Anyways, even if, uh, because I see that more questions and comments are arriving now, uh, we'll collect all of them and we'll try to answer all of them at least during the, the last session. So don't worry, you will, you will have answers to your questions. So thank you again and bye-bye. Does Pepsa want to say anything more? I'd like to say something. This is uh, Dr. Ziba from Fogarty. Um, as uh, Philippe, you've mentioned that there will be some uh, in-person workshops related to this topic. I think people need to know that it's really important that they attend all the sessions related to this if they want to be eligible. And so that's really important. You can't just attend one and then be expected to uh, be invited. And not everybody will be able to be invited, but we'll do our best. Uh, but it's critical to, to uh, participate in all the webinars. Yes, thank indeed. You. Yes, indeed, thank you, Sibella. I think it's, this is very important because uh, we cannot do a proper biological risk assessment if we don't practice it, because it's a team exercise and so on. So we need practical workshops. Because now the, the new biosafety uh, manual, uh, WHO biosafety manual is there, uh, there is a momentum for at least present you that. But when we organize the workshops, the practical workshop, we won't go to this again. So we'll do mostly exercise. So it's very important that you really follow all the sessions for that. Uh, and you, in that case, you will have a priority for, for the workshops. Uh, especially, I want to discuss uh, the description of biological safety. That uh, you have to scale up uh, all of uh, Pakistan. Still, your biological safety is limited to a uh, mega cities, transportation. Uh, so, you are requested to scale up 
I'm sorry, we are unable to hear you clearly. If you have any question, please write it in the chat box and we will try our best to answer it. <laughs> 